I'm Larry Johnson, a professor at Texas A&M University, and today we're going to talk about membranes and receptors. We want to look at the importance of membranes in terms of compartmentalization of the cells. We want to look at the overall structure of the cell membranes, methods of studying membranes and receptors, and some of the properties of the membrane uh, receptors. The cells compose of both a nucleus, and here we see a nucleus, the darker structures uh, here, and there's a nucleus here, uh, and it stains with uh, h and &E, it stains with hematoxin, that's the reason it's kind of blue, because of the nucleic acids inside there staining to the, uh, the basic dye. And then the cytoplasm is what's around the nucleus, and we see the cytoplasm here of these couple plasma cells, cytoplasm in through there, which is uh, composed of a host of, of organelles. You have the Golgi apparatus here, you have the rough in the plasma reticulum, you have the nuclear envelope with the nuclear pores, uh, nucleolus is inside the nucleus, lipid droplets, uh, you have just regular um, particles inside there and cytoplasmic matrix. You have the cell membrane, and mitochondria, and centrioles, a couple centrioles there, like an adiposome, and then also we have secretory granules as well. So the cytoplasm is pink because it has mostly proteins and it binds to the negative stain, as opposed to uh, the nucleus has uh, uh, negative charges and so it stains uh, with the hematoxin. So the positive charges stain uh, the, the uh, eosin. So uh, here we see intestinal absorptive cell. This is a simple columnar cell. There's this base, there's an apex, there's a brush border. These are junctions between adjacent cells which allow epithelial cells uh, to make uh, a lumen and we see the lumen right here. So uh, the cells have three major components inside there. They've got the, the membranous organelles, uh, that is the common structures inside the cell. Uh, the cell uh, membrane is one of those. Uh, the nuclear membrane is another one. Rough in the plasma reticulum, as we see here. Smooth in the plasma reticulum. The Golgi apparatus, as we see up here. Uh, mitochondria uh, and lysosomes uh, are membranous organelles as they are associated with membranes. Uh, Non-membranous organelles uh, could be the side of skeletal components, microtubules, uh, microfilaments, intermediate filaments, or it could be ribosomes uh, as well, things that are not necessarily associated with the membrane. The other class of uh, items are inclusions. They're expendable. They need not be inside there uh, for the cell to live, uh, but it's very important for the cell's function. Uh, nutrients, glycogen stored in the liver, stored in muscle, lipid stored in steroid secreting cells, uh, pigment, uh, melanin granules for color of skin, secretory granules, zymogen granules that we see up through there are the secretions. So these are of three different types of inclusions and inclusion is one of three types of classes of, of of items inside of a cell, membranous, non-membranous, and inclusions. If we look at the membranous one, we can see the nuclear envelope is one, that's the nucleus of, a, of that cell, uh, and then also the uh, cell membrane, uh, mitochondria as membranous organelles. Non-membranous organelles uh, are these filaments. You have the actin and mycin filaments. You can actually see the little Z line uh, here between sarcomeres. Uh, and here we can see the, the Z line from here and here. And so that's one sarcomere or one a unit of contraction from this line to this line or this line to that line. Inclusions, you see this big fat globule there. Also there's inclusions in this mast cell. Here you see the nucleus and we see the granules inside there. Those are inclusions. Now if we look at the cell membrane, it's about eight to 10 nanometers in thickness. It's a, uh, a lipid bilayer with uh, protein inserted in there and carbohydrates on the surface. And the function is to regulate traffic and ions and macromolecules. Uh, and also it possesses devices for attachment of cells where one cell can be attached to another cell by these uh, 
uh, by these uh, cell membranes uh, attachments uh, that uh, differ in different functions you see there and to allow cell cells to uh, communicate. Also, uh, the cell membrane is, uh, contains antigens, uh, molecules on the surface, and which is a basis of recognition and tissue specificity. Uh, epithelium is different from connective tissue because of things on its surface um, makes it uh, identifiable. Uh, cancerous cells are identified by macrophages because of, of structures uh, on, on, the, on the surface. Also, the membrane has a series of pumps and, uh, and devices, ionic pumps that uh, pump out um, and, and set up gradients uh, that can be used for uh, things to pass through. Uh, also, they possess uh, receptors, and some of these are receptors for hormones. Like here's a receptor for a hormone, uh, and then the receptor actually interacts to the inside. It causes a second messenger, which causes DNA change or gene expression to occur. So an uh, outside cell can send a hormone. Uh, a hormone can't go through, but it can send a message through uh, that then uh, can change a DNA synthesis. Uh, and then it possesses a mechanism to generate message. Um, uh, RNA, uh, messenger, uh, messengers, which are a psychic AMP here, to activate the cell for, this, uh, for the cell response. And so hormone binds a receptor, uh, goes through a uh, psychic AMP uh, to trigger unique things in the cell. Now in uh, cells we have uh, two sets of reactions. One is a scalar reaction, uh, and those are like proteins that are produced by free ribosomes. Uh, so you have precursor A, precursor B in the same container as product C. Now, in contrast, when you have membranes, you can have a vectorial uh, reaction, uh, which requires membrane uh, to, uh, to be petitioned, like rough in the plasma reticulum, for example, where your ribosomes are on the outside, but the product is actually on the inside. So precursor A and B are in a different container than, than C. And here we see membrane compartmentalization where we have the nucleus is uh, one uh, membrane that is uh, holding things. You've got the cell membrane uh, mark, marking the limits of a cell. And then you've got membranes uh, with the secretory granules as well, uh, as well as uh, rough ER that we can't really identify. And this is a vectoral uh, secretion with an eye right there. Uh, um, uh, membranes and compartmentalization, we can see it here. There's a rough in the plasma reticulum in this pancreas cell. Big nucleus, Golgi apparatus, secretory granules there. In the stomach, uh, we can see it in this parietal cell where the lumen has actually enfolded inside the cell itself. And so this is a secretory canaliculus that will allow uh, uh, hydrogen and chloride ions to get together, get hydrochloric acid uh, put together. Uh, in this space to be to be discharged. We can see it again, uh, lots of mitochondria, and we can see the mitochondria with the telutinib blue. Uh, this is a, a parietal cell, parietal cell, parietal cell, parietal cell. These other guys in there are the chief cells uh, in the stomach. Now, also compartmentalization is important when you're phagocytizing things. So you want to put uh, your imagination of their cell membrane comes in there Lysosomes fuse with that. Men's enzymes are contained in and enzymes are contained in the membranes, and then they fuse here uh, to uh, break down that bacterium. So compartmentalization, uh, whenever you phagocyte something, is very important. Uh, you uh, hold your enzymes in check until you're ready for them. Let them fuse with whatever you phagocytize. Now, some things in membranes, it's a selective barrier, but it can't stop everything from going through. Uh, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, benzene, things go right through. Water goes through pretty freely, but they may have some kind of channel associated with that. Urea, uh, glycerol goes right through. Glucose we need, it doesn't go through. And ions, uh, especially charged ions, don't really go through. And so you have to make some kind of arrangements for that to occur. And here we can see where glucose is high concentration inside the cell. It's lower uh, in the lumen of the gut and it's lower on the outside. So in order to make glucose go against its concentration gradient, 
it has to come in with this little, uh, uh, this is a SIM port uh, that uh, uses sodium. So sodium comes in with glucose, brings that. Now, so now glucose is a high concentration, and then it just goes out with a facilitator protein at the bottom because it's going down its concentration gradient. It doesn't need sodium. But in order to uh, have the cell uh, be receptive to sodium, you have to remove the sodium uh, from inside the cell, and that's what is happening here uh, where you have an ATPase pump uh, where... Uh, you use ATP uh, to exchange sodium for uh, for potassium. So here we see a smooth endoplasmic reticulum often is associated with uh, lipid. Uh, and then we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, ribosomes on its surface makes it rough. Uh, and we have mitochondria. These are membranous organelles. In the mitochondria, uh, uh, we have two sets of membranes, the outer membrane uh, and then the inner membrane. And it's on the inner part of the of the uh, uh, of the mitochondria that you have these globular uh, things where they synthesize uh, ATP uh, and you do that by setting up a gradient uh, in this uh, uh, outer chamber so there's a, a pH gradient that the pH the hydrogen ions wants to come in through here uh, and in doing so uh, they're able to uh, uh, cause uh, uh, further phosphorylation to ADP to ATP. Uh, and here we see lots of other uh, membranes. Uh, this is uh, in, a, in a spermatozoa. Uh, you can see the mitochondria through there. You can see the, the nuclear membrane, the outer acrosomal membrane, um, the uh, outer acrosomal membrane, inner acrosomal membrane, and a plasma membrane. So there's a host of membranes that holds this water bag of enzymes uh, in check until... Uh, uh, fertilization uh, is uh, in the process. So membranes, uh, a characteristic of those, a self-assemble and they're self-sealed. And why do they do that? And these are some of the things that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. Amphipathic molecule, two ends, polar end and nonpolar end. Phospholipid bilayer, so two layers, phospholipids, uh, 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 parallel to one another. Fluidity. Cholesterol increased the fluidity of the membrane. Fluidity is how uh, things migrate or move around in the membrane. Uh, gangliosides, uh, glycolipid with salicylic acid. The sialic acid is what gives the cells a net negative charge on the plasma membrane. So if we look at amphipathic molecules, two ends, you see a polar end here and a nonpolar end. And so we see the head and the tails. And the nonpolar end doesn't like water. Um, and so it runs away from water. And here you can see that whenever you washing your hands with soap, you're really making micelles. So the micelles are produced a little circular ball with the tails trying to run away from the water. Also, you can have a phospholipid bilayer is another way to get the, the tails away from the water. And this is spontaneous uh, uh, production, and we'll see that here in a minute. But if we look at the phospholipid, you see uh, two lipid uh, legs in through here, uh, which, is, um, which keeps aqueous uh, things out of the membrane uh, if, if it wants to do that. And then here you can have different groups, proteins, uh, carbohydrates that you have in there. If you take a phospholipids, you just take some of these and throw them uh, into a water in a container such as this with water on either side, it will spontaneously make a black membrane. It'll make a black, black membrane, and that is that the uh, hydrophobic tails are running away from water and they stay with one another so they can get out of the reach of the water. Membranes are self-assembled and self-sealed uh, to get rid, to get the nonpolar tails away from the water. That's what it's trying to do, and that's when you rip a membrane, it reseals uh, for this same reason. So it's self-assembled, self-sealed, due to the amphipathic structure of the phospholipid where the tails uh, try to escape the water environment. Now, in the membrane, in the uh, lipid bilayer, a phospholipid bilayer, 
uh, you the, the each phospholipid can twirl around, can swing back and forth, can uh, migrate back and forth, but usually they can't flip flop. You have to have a special enzyme to allow that to occur, but it does occur, and we'll talk about it later on. Cholesterol has a rigid ring structure, and in doing so, uh, it renders uh, a space in here. The more space that you have in here, uh, the more fluidity, the more likely that things can move along. So in that sense, um, it's kind of like antifreeze a little bit in that under cold conditions, it will still keep uh, the membrane uh, uh, fluid, uh, even in cold states. Uh, and here we can see uh, uh, the fluid and the viscous uh, membrane, uh, and that's due to uh, uh, disulfide bonds. If you, or if you had double bonds in through here, uh, then what happens is it takes up more space. And so if it's unsaturated, uh, then you, uh, it takes up more space and less, and so you become more fluid and less viscous. So uh, proteins are membrane components. We want to interpret the um, uh, trilaminar structure, we'll talk about the fluid mosaic model, uh, peripheral versus inner proteins, uh, how the extraction procedures, and transmembrane orientation and its interaction with cytoskeleton. That's what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So you see, uh, uh, you not only have amphipathic uh, phospholipids, but also uh, the proteins can be there. You can have hydrophobic amino acids, and that would, uh, again, want to, uh, the, the, these groups will want to run away from the water, and doing so, it gets embedded uh, in the membrane. So the proteins, as well as phospholipids, can be uh, 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 can be amphipathic. Uh, trilaminar structure uh, is actually two black lines and a white line in the middle. And so basically what happens is uh, uh, the polar ends uh, makes the line, uh, and the phospholipid doesn't take up the stain. And that's why you see... Uh, you see uh, a clear area in the center. So the fluid mosaic model, um, uh, a drawing of what uh, the membrane is like, is a phospholipid bilayer, as you see there. Proteins project through carbohydrates on the surface. Some membranes are transmembranes, some are peripheral proteins, some are integral proteins inside or outside the cell. So if you uh, look at intestinal absorptive cells, you can see in their plasma membrane, they have proteins that are enzymes uh, that break down some of the food stuff right at the surface of the cell is what they have. Uh, all kinds of enzymes are in these cells, but some of them are actually in the membrane itself as the proteins, and the proteins can be transmembrane, integral, peripheral, uh, or actually a Protein is, is actually attached, has a phospholipid tail is another option. Now, if you uh, want to solubilize uh, uh, proteins in a, in a membrane, what you do is you use SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, and it makes little micelles. So it, it's got uh, protein, and these little uh, structures uh, keep uh, the hydrophobic region, which is in the middle, still hydrophobic, uh, and but it's solubilized, so now you can uh, run this on a gel. And so here you can see some more micelles, some of SES and some other regular uh, micelles. And so whenever you uh, put uh, it, it on a gel and you have electrophoresis, you have a charge on it, uh, you, uh, you can uh, estimate the molecular weight. And so uh, larger things uh, are more slowly to migrate. Smaller things are quicker to migrate, uh, as you see there. And again, so you just put these on the gel. Over time, you have electrical charge in through there. Uh, over time, uh, the proteins will migrate toward that charge. Uh, as a consequence, uh, you can estimate the molecular weight by using a standard of something that you know. So you have a standard that you run at the same time as you run your unknown and then whenever the bands correspond then that will tell you uh, the molecular weight 
uh, of your protein uh, in relation to the, to the standard. Now there is a biconcave shape of red blood cells. As you can see there, it's not spherical, it's red. And this is an isotonic solution. But if you have a hypertonic solution, uh, more salt, uh, it will be crenated. Uh, but that between here and here can flip back and forth. But if you put it into water, uh, it will swell and then finally it will pop if you do that. But the reason that you have the biconcave in a, in a normal isotomic typical state is because you have the spectrum and you can see the spectrum here migrating uh, actually att uh, attached it to the band, band one, band two, uh, band four, band one, band four, 4.1, 4.9, different ones, and then it's a spectrum. And so uh, you have these uh, 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 you have these proteins that are attached to other proteins that are in, in, infused in the membrane, and so you're able to hold uh, the membrane as a biconcave shape. Uh, here is another SDSGL electrophoresis uh, one, uh, but this way we're detecting proteins by identifying molecular weight uh, as, as, as we just described, but also uh, binding uh, to testosterone uh, as detected by uh, fluorography. And what happens is you have radioactivity uh, that is causing a fluorescent uh, screen uh, to uh, fluoresce, and then you uh, are fo uh, exposing your auto uh, photo photographic emulsion, a film, whatever, uh, by that reflection. So in this case, we looked at a molecular weight and then also uh, determined uh, if that protein would bind testosterone uh, as well. And so basically that's what that is. Autoreography is a direct exposure of the alpha and beta particles, uh, beta uh, and gamma rays. But uh, fluorography is exposure of secondary rays due to the fluorescent screen. So this is indirect, direct, indirect. Now, in order to extract uh, proteins from, uh, from membranes, high salt concentration and high pH will remove peripheral proteins. So if you've got peripheral proteins, not all of them, but many of them can be removed by high salt. So you treat it with high salt and then um, you uh, run a gel on what came off of the membrane. Uh, also, a Triton X100 is non-ionic detergent. It breaks some bonds between lipid and proteins and it uh, punches little holes in the, in the membrane. SCS dissolves everything for extracting all the proteins. Now, electroperoxidase uh, will attach to proteins that has a tyrosine residue and mo most proteins do. And then, uh, uh, binding to the lactoproxidase would be I-125 radioactivity. So now you can make a protein radioactive by its binding to lactoproxidase if you have a tyrosine, and then that would be uh, bind to uh, I-125. Lactons are, are things that bind to carbohydrates, and so they have different uh, proteins from plants. Uh, that bind different types of carbohydrates. And you can use that with microscopy on a gel or the fin affinity chromatography that we're going to talk about a little later on. And then also there's prolytic enzymes. If you, uh, if you treat a, a protein with enzymes, it's going to chop it up, make it smaller, uh, and then when you run on a gel, it'll be missing from where, that, where it should be on the gel. Immuno, uh, uh, cytochemistry is where you have antibodies that bind to specific uh, specific proteins in the cell. And here we see the immunocytochemistry showing you uh, the uh, microtubules of the cell. Here's this nucleus and these are microtubules running through there and it shows you mitochondria. In this case it's showing you that uh, microtubules are associated with orientation of the mitochondria. A freeze fracture is another a way to study membranes uh, and what happens when you fracture it uh, the membrane splits down the middle uh, in a phospholipid bilayer and so this is one cell and another cell and it jumps over to this cell uh, as you see so if you remove all this from the right here 
uh, you will be looking, if you look in that way, you're looking at, at that hot half or the ectoplasmic uh, face. Uh, but over here, you're looking at the inside half or the, the uh, protoplasmic face. So whether you're looking at the E or P face uh, makes a difference uh, in where the cleavage occurs. Uh, also, you can have carbon replica uh, electron microscopy where you, you have the specimen there uh, and you blow in um, platinum or gold or something and it piles up on, the, on one side and doesn't go on the other side. Kind of like rain in a mountain, it dumps on one side but not the other side. And then you put carbon on top of it uh, to stabilize it. And then you thaw up your sample and now you're looking at the replica. You're not looking at, uh, at the specimen, you're looking at the replica that we have there and you can see some of those. Here we see inside the cell, outside the cell. This is the P face, and this is the E face, ectoplasmic, protoplasmic face. And here you can see the E face on the outside, P face on the inside, more particles on the P face. P face, E face. Uh, now fluidity is how proteins and uh, uh, phospholipids can migrate around uh, in the membrane. And here you can see where uh, one vesicle is fused with another one, uh, and uh, this one has been uh, tagged some way. And so when they fuse together, it's all on one side, and then before long, it'll be evenly distri distributed. Fluidity uh, will cause a, a random distribution uh, of, the, of the structures. Um, and here we see a, a phospholipid bilayer with proteins and sugars uh, on its surface. Uh, a transmembrane protein and a peripheral protein. Now, sometimes uh, a cell doesn't like fluidity to be total at random, and so what it does is the proteins there and attach to one another. And sometimes the proteins is on the outside that attaches to the proteins of the membrane. Sometimes they're on the inside, and sometimes there's junctions between adjacent ones, and that holds the membrane uh, in check. Now, one of those examples, this one where the, the proteins go together, is the urinary bladder. Now, the urinary bladder, when it it's full, uh, it, the bladder extends. But the individual cell cannot extend because uh, you can't stretch the membrane. So in order for uh, the cell to accommodate the stretch state, it unfolds a uh, membrane that it has tucked inside. Uh, and you see these little plaques here of, of, of protein inside there uh, that are rigid. So this, this same type of structure is here. And so whenever uh, you uh, look at the uh, transitional epithelium in the urinary bladder, you see these flattened vesicles. See these flattened vesicles due to uh, the protein, uh, that in rigid part of the protein in there. So it doesn't make a circle. It makes these flattened vesicles that you can see. And this, this is continuous with the lumen. This would be continuous with the lumen. And so whenever the, the cell needs to stretch, uh, it just unfolds. It, the, the membrane itself cannot stretch. Uh, the, the cell membrane has to unfold. And here we see uh, uh, spectrum and, uh, and band 3. Uh, on the surface of the cell, which allows it to be a uh, biconcave, as we see. Uh, sometimes you, you don't want fluidity of a cell totally. And here's one of those examples. Uh, sometimes you want uh, uh, pumps or, or channels or proteins or recognition things on the apical surface, but not the basal lateral borders. Uh, and so... Uh, here you have specialized junctions that prevent things from going through, and that's one of the ways that we mentioned to you that cells uh, could do to reduce its fluidity. So that's what it does. It restricts that. An example of that, of why you would need different here than there, is here we have a glucose uh, um, symport, this protein here, that allows glucose and sodium to come in. Okay, in contrast, down here, uh, uh, glucose just goes through without sodium, so a different a different protein here than up there to facilitate 
glucose moving against the concentration gradient and then down its concentration gradient uh, inside, inside the cell. And so we can see it's tight junctions. These are tight junctions which restrict the fluidity that normally would occur. You still have fluidity in the apex, still have it in the basal lateral border, but you don't have it between the two. <clears throat> and so uh, here we see that the proteins are glycosylated on the outside. That's what we see here is a glycocalyx coat. So we're looking, really looking at the sugars binding uh, that's there. So you can also have receptors, so ganglion size, glycolipid, basilic acid residue, uh, uh, glycoproteins, which are polysaccharide sugars, covalently linked to protein, and you can have ligands uh, that interact with the receptors. Uh, and whenever you do, there's two characteristics of those that indicate that you have receptors. One is that they're specific. Uh, it, it, uh, it has a high binding or high... Uh, um, transport, uh, but they're satchable. You, you only have so many of them, so you can't do that. Uh, and so the methods of uh, uh, binding, binding assay with localization, uh, gel electrophoresis, measure molecular weight, and immunoblot, where you have a gel to paper and then label the antibodies on top of that. Here we see uh, plant lectins, so concannabinin A, soybean lectin, uh, different lectins, and these bind to specific sugars. And so you're able to identify the different types of sugars by what's there. So lectins binding, they can bind in a microscopy, they can bind in gel electrophoresis, uh, they can do it in affinity chromatography as well. Uh, and you have enzymes, uh, as I mentioned, and immunocytochemistry. Uh, an another component of, of the uh, cytochemistry is immuno precipitation. So immunoprecipitation is where uh, you have uh, solubilized proteins and you have antibodies against that specific protein. It binds to there. And then you have a protein A or G added there that will bind to the antibody. And then you're able to centrifuge this down uh, and bring down uh, the protein of interest if it happened to be there. Immunoprecipitation where normally it would be solubilized, you're going to make it precipitate by the antibody binding to the specific one uh, and uh, the protein A binding to the other uh, end of the antibody. There's also paper chromatography. Uh, you can uh, measure mixer, mixers. You can look at the pure, purity of things, you identify things, test for compounds in a, in a mixture. Uh, and an important part of this is differential affinity. Uh, and that is uh, whether it has more affinity to move or more affinity to stay put uh, in there. So chromatography, you have a mobile and stationary phase. Uh, differential is how things differ. Affinity is traction. A mobile medium is some kind of liquid or something that the proteins can move in. Uh, and... Um, uh, absorption of the media, stationary phase, absorption of media, that's a stationary phase. So chromatography is a technique to allow you to separate things. You can do it in paper chromatography is one way. Uh, some of the principles is capillary action. As you stick the paper down there, it's got to absorb uh, the liquid if, if it's going to uh, migrate up. Uh, solubility, you have to dissolve the membranes for the proteins to be able to migrate and then uh, a separation of the mixture uh, that must be solubilized and it must be in a solution that's solubilized. If you have something uh, that is alcohol soluble, then it's likely if you use water, it won't dissolve it. Uh, and that's what we see in this experiment. So these are different concentrations of alcohol and these are three different colors of Sharpie pens. And you can see when we've got 20% alcohol, we started seeing some flaring there of the red dye. 50% showed that the red was really red and yellow, as we can see. And then when you get to 100%, uh, you got maximum uh, migration. So in other words, Sharpie pen is more alcohol-soluble than it is water-soluble. Uh, now, there's different types of, of chromatography. Uh, there's an ion exchange where you have charges. So uh, it's the charge. Uh, that 
label the beads, and then if you got positive beads, then the negative uh, components will want to stick to them. And so you're able to select out the negative components. Uh, you also have uh, gel filtration chromatography. Uh, and here, where you have real small channels, uh, and the smaller things get trapped in the channels, and the bigger things uh, go through, this is gel filtration. This is how the, the activated charcoal works in your uh, in the fan uh, region of uh, of your stove. Where you turn the stove on, when you're cooking something and make a smell, uh, it absorbs that odors and put them into the small little small chambers. That's why you need to change that activated charcoal ever so often. Another way is affinity chromatography, uh, where uh, you use covalently bound um, uh, things that would bind to that. So you may have antibodies here that would bind to a certain protein, uh, and that would facilitate a selection of that protein where other things would just slip along. Uh, so you use these materials for differential affinity. So each one of those is making differential affinity and you have a mobile phase, things going through, and a stationary phase. And these are actually the stationary phase to charge uh, this particle size uh, or uh, the, uh, the covalently bond um, protein. Now if you take a red blood cell and put it in water, uh, it will pop and the hemoglobin will go from it and you're just left with a leaky ghost. And that will seal itself because membrane seal. But if you disturb it like sonicated, sometimes uh, you can get uh, right side out vesicles and then inside out vesicles. So they can be flip flop. And that allow you to, to study inside or outside uh, of the membrane. So the function of receptors is uh, cell adhesion and recognition, uh, cell migration, uh, also recognition of. Um, regulation of metabolic function. Downregulation is where you reduce the number of receptors or reduce the response of a cell. Upregulation, if you increase the number of receptors, you increase the, the, the total amount of psychic AMB being produced, and so you stimulate the cell. Increase the cell's response to stimuli is what upregulation is. Now, uh, if you uh, use simple diffusion, you got more on one side, then you'll have more on the other side, uh, then this would be the line. The more you have, the more you have on this side. But if you have a carrier diffusion or you have some kind of receptors, then you have a high affinity. That is, they attract it more than simple diffusion. But it's satchable, it'll level off. You're gonna run out uh, of, these, of these receptors. So these are two characteristics of receptors illustrated here. And so the cell membrane, as we talked about before, provides recognition. Uh, it provides uh, activation of the cells for various uh, responses. Uh, and here we see antibodies in the immune system where you have mast cells for allergic reaction. So the plasma cell produces antibodies. Antibodies bind to the mast cell. And then whenever uh, the antigen uh, is exposed to uh, the antibody bound mast cells, then that causes a mast cell to discharge uh, its, uh, its chemicals. So you work with antibodies on the surface uh, as well, and that's what gives us specificity, because these uh, IgE antibodies can bind to specific antigens. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, and whenever they do, whatever the antigen that is, it's going to trigger. <clears throat> so they bind antigen binds, socket AMP increase in the cell, and that causes influx of calcium, which causes exocytosis. And here comes histamine, um, uh, heparin, um, uh, phosphoglycans, and different things that cause itching to occur. Here's an, a normal mast cell and a degranulating uh, mast cell. Now, uh, whenever a cell wants to phagocytize things, it usually moves things over to one side. So you can have different binding sites, but then over a period of time, it brings it over to one side. And you can see that. So it's, this is distributed throughout, then on and all of a sudden, it's all over on one side. Uh, and then, as I mentioned to you before, uh, uh, different ways that uh, the cell can uh, regulate the fluidity of proteins uh, within it, and this is one of the ways it does that. Uh, here we see a, 
a white blood cell eating a yeast cell, uh, you can see the rich, uh, actin rich area that would be causing a pseudopodia going around through there, and you can see the, the granules inside there. So, all of these would be uh, membrane brown. So, in summary, membranes allow a cell a high degree of chemical uh, heterogeneity, different things. It provides surfaces and interfaces, uh, the workspace, workbench for physiologic processes. It has enzymes right in the, right in the membrane. Um, internal partition of cytoplasm, enzyme substrate products, um, efficiency of the complex chemical reactions amplified uh, uh, area. Uh, you have a gradients, uh, regulation cell activity, and hold in reserve, reserve a large repertoire of unexpressed biochemical reactions. So in our lysosomes, we have a membrane containing all these enzymes that could kill us. So in summary, again, Membranes and receptors. Um, membranes are important in cell because of compartmentalization, segregation of products, vectoral with the eye uh, uh, reactions, uh, and uh, development of gradients. And receptors provide a mechanism for the cell to have physiologic response to external stimuli. So we have the, the cell membrane uh, open up, and next time we're going to look inside the cell. We're going to look at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the Golgi, uh, and the secretion. I want to thank um, the books uh, that have provided many of these illustrations. I did not do any of those illustrations. They're all uh, um, um, barred for education purposes uh, from, these, uh, from these books, and I want to acknowledge uh, their original source. Uh, of, of these illustrations and, and many pictures that we have. Thank you.